of the text we're going to look at this morning. Before we jump into it, I'm just going to pray and ask that God would speak to us. Let's pray together. God, again, we just come before you. We're grateful that we can be in your presence. We're grateful, God, for time with their family. God, we're grateful for how you're working, how you sustain us, how you provide, how you protect. God, we're so grateful for your love. You tell us in your word to celebrate with those who are celebrating, to mourn with those who mourn, and I know in our church family we have people across the spectrum of those things. And so I pray that you would encourage our family this morning, that you would encourage us with an awareness that we're not alone, that we're with you, and we are walking through this with one another. I pray that this wouldn't just be a place that we log into, that this wouldn't be a place that we sit at, but this, this is a place we're connected with. And so, God, I pray that you would let us see what you're doing. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would be the one speaking this morning. We just praise you and thank you for all of this in your name. Amen. Uh, let me just throw this out. I am absolutely loving the air and everything, which means probably other people are cold. And so uh, I don't know if any of that anybody feels that way. Uh, yes, yeah, some people are shaking their heads. So yeah, let's l- l- maybe just turn the air down a little bit. Um, so last week we talked about, again, I love it, but you know, I know I'm weird. Um, last week we talked about the fact that we need to get ready for the season that is ahead. The challenges that this year has brought, whether it's with the pandemic or political things or racial tension, um, none of this is slowing down. And if anything, as we move into the next season, it's probably only going to go up. Uh, we may be taking a dip in some ways, but winter is coming. We used Joseph's story in Egypt last week as an example of the fact that he told Pharaoh, take advantage of these seven years of plenty to get ready for the seven years of famine that are ahead. And so the question that we raised last week is, what can we be doing in the next couple months to get ready for winter? What can we be doing in September and October to be getting ready for November, December, January, February, um, when some of these challenges are a little bit more intense. And the three things we said last week we need to be doing to get ready is we need to have regular times with Jesus, we need to hold tight to the hope that Jesus gives, and we have to circle up with other believers. All of those coming from Hebrews chapter 10. I appreciated what uh, Josie Condra, she's one of our, uh, her and her husband Mark are in Southeast Asia, a missionary couple, from our church, and she texts me uh, later on after that saying that she just wanted to yell, all hands on deck, because in reality, that's what it is. This can't just be something you heard me say on a Sunday or a church thing. It's, this is real. When we know that the challenges are ahead and we know that we can spend time getting ready for them, we need to do what we need to do to get ready for them, and we can't just blow that off. And so what can we do to take advantage of this season to get ready for what's next. Uh, Jordan Mallory from church texts me and talk, looking at the season ahead, and he said this, it doesn't mean we should build, this season doesn't, in this season we shouldn't build thicker walls and hoard more resources, but intentionally lock arms with other believers in supporting each other to keep trusting Jesus. And I love the language that he gave there, that this is a time when we need to be locking arms with one another. We need to be locking arms and getting ready for the season ahead. And so I, in kind of in the line of that, I want to revisit that final theme from last week of being together, of community, of locking arms, of circling up. And it took my heart back to Psalm 133. Uh, so I preached on this passage a couple of years ago, and um, but my heart, you know, just could not kind of let this, this it wouldn't leave my mind the last couple of days. And revisiting this, it was like, this is a passage we need to look at again. And if anything, right now especially. And so this is a really short psalm. It says this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like when, when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, 
For there the Lord has commanded the blessings, life forevermore. Now that first verse, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. How good and pleasant, how desirable, how wonderful, how awesome it is when there's unity. This psalm, Psalm 133, is one of the psalms of ascent. It's a group of 15 psalms from Psalm 120 to 134 that the pilgrims would use on their journey to Jerusalem for the various festivals. The Psalms of Ascent, these 15 psalms, were their travel songs. This was the music that they'd listen to, that they would sing on the journey. This was their playlist. When you were on a road trip when you were younger, were there songs that you would do sometimes? Or if, did, if you were ever in a bus with a bunch of people and some people would break out in song, am I the only one that had to suffer through some of that? Um, these are the songs that they would sing. These are the songs that would help them pass the journey. These are the songs that they would have on their lips, knowing what this journey was about. And when they, you know, my, my kids are at this point where they're starting to really like music and get into music, especially my daughter, and we'll be in the car and a song will come on. And that's kind of our, our uh, rules is we can take turns picking music on the way back. And so she'll play a song, I'll play a song, and sometimes we'll just listen to the radio. But we have veto power, like, ah, oh, I hate that one. And some songs will come on, it's like, she's like, oh, turn that off. And some of the songs I'm like, so glad you don't like that song because <laughs> it sounds so stupid and then others it's like oh turn that one up and so we have this idea turn that one up well psalm 133 is one that needs to be turned up this is one that needs to be cranked up unity how good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters in the family of god can live as one turn that one up Growing up, anytime my siblings and I were in the car, there was always drama. There was always a fight. When my kids get in the car, you can pretty much count down from 10. There's going to be a fight or something like that. Being in the car, being on a journey, being in a closed place just invites drama. But the writer here says how amazing for siblings to live in unity. I know for parents sometimes that seems like an impossible thing. But that's why, well, yeah, it would be amazing. But he says how amazing it is while on the road trip of life, on the journey of faith, it is a good thing, it is a vital thing for people to be together, for people to not just be together, but to be unified. And don't miss the nuance there. It is good for God's people to be unified. Because if you have a relationship with Jesus, this is something that I, I, like, I like to remind myself and I like to remind our church about. That is not an exclusively personal relationship with Jesus. You made a personal decision to follow him, but that's a family relationship. You're connected with others. That's why it isn't just cheesy religious talk when we say refer to other people in the church as brother and sister. It's the reality that this is the family of God and how good it is, how awesome it is. Turn that one up when we live in unity. The New Testament affirms the importance of this. It says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. The, the pilgrims, when they would, get, they would be traveling from all other parts of Israel, uh, they would travel from all of the parts of the country. They would be in different, whether it was the north or the south, maybe even exile for some. But they would travel and they would get to the temple. And when they would get to the temple, it wasn't about where they were from or what connection they were, or what neighborhood they lived in, what city, whatever. It was we're God's people. And every gathering was like a mini reunion for them. And this is what the New Testament is telling us. This is what God's word is telling us, is that when we get together, it's like a mini family reunion. It's not, I'm from this part of the, school, the country. I'm not from this city. It isn't that I go to this school. It's, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's our first and foremost identity when we're gathered together. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or for, 
Greek, slaves are free, for all were made to drink of one spirit. We, not, we want to turn up our unity, not just our voices in worship, but relationally strive for unity in the body of Christ. Something that we work for. Not that everybody's going to know every single person. Not that you're going to be best friends with every single person in the room. But we have to acknowledge and live in the truth that we are part of something and there should be some connections. This should be something about being in this place where it is different than other places. It's something about different being around these people because of who we are and how we're connected with one another. You can walk into a huge, crowded mall, store, gathering, whatever. I know that's weird in this time frame. But when there's a lot of people and you can see a whole lot of people, but when you see some of these people, that should make you perk up. You should have a smile on your face because that's somebody you're unified with, you're connected with. That's a brother or a sister. That's how we should see this place. Unity changes how we see one another. Unity changes how we go through life together. Unity changes how we see conflicts that come up. Unity influences how we care for one another when trials happen. Unity impacts how we affirm one another. And this season creates so many unique challenges that many of us haven't had to face before. But that, those challenges don't change who we are. The challenges don't change the unity that we are have. It might challenge that unity, but that unity is still a goal. It's still a part of who we are, and it's still something we should be striving for. And so I want to challenge you with that this morning. Don't let the challenges of this season make you, th- make you miss the importance of being unified with the body of Christ. Don't let the challenge of this season isolate you from community. Why is unity in the family of God such a good thing? Well, this psalmist gives us two reasons. The first one is this. Pursuing unity strengthens and encourages the family of God. Pursuing unity strengthens and encourages the family of God. Verse 2, it's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Now that that verse builds as we read it. It is some imagery that we're not typically used to here. But he says precious oil. Oil was a symbol of joy, of pleasure, of goodness. Running down on the beard. Oil was used when anointing people, specifically when anointing priests for their work in the temple. So this was not just any oil. This was good oil. This was true joy, true goodness on the beard of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. He was the one anointed to represent Israel in sacrifices, in worship, specifically on the Day of Atonement, running down on the collar of his robes. There is an abundance of this good oil used to anoint the priest who would lead Israel in worship. Not just little drips, not just tiny amounts, but pouring out this oil. This is the image that the psalmist uses to uh, depict our unity. Our unity is like this abundant, good oil. Unity is like good oil used to prepare those who are set apart for ministry in God's temple. Unity doesn't just drip the goodness of God. It moves in abundance. Your unity helps facilitate worship. It sets the spiritual climate. Our unity helps those in the family grow as the children of God. The unity that a community has enhances the spiritual vitality of that place. Let me explain it from the opposite perspective. When the people of God are not unified, then prayer is hindered. When the people of God are not unified, then encouragement stops. When the people of God aren't unified, then truth can be divided into segments. When the people of God aren't unified, then agendas come before people. When the people of God aren't unified, then people carry their burdens alone. 
when the people of God aren't unified, then we're on our own with our doubts and our questions. But when unity does happen, when that good oil is flowing, then the people of God lift one another up in prayer. The encouragement abounds. We rally around what's true. Our agenda is God. We carry one another's burdens. People remind us of who God is and who we are in him. When we are unified, one, then the family of God is strengthened and encouraged. When we are one and we're unified and we're pursuing that unity, our hearts are getting the things that we need. Think about all of the discouragement that may have come up over the last few months. Think of all, all the, the, the questions, all the frustrations, and the varying levels that they would be. There's no way of those not happening. The season just brings those things. But the heaviness that they are, they become heavier when we carry them in isolation. But when we're connected with one another, when we're unified with one another, when we're going through the season with others, those burdens become lighter because we're not carrying them alone, but others are helping us along the way. We're being encouraged by others along the way. This is why the New Testament says this, bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, and you also must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We are going to be difficult at times with one another. Somebody's going to mess up. Somebody's going to say something wrong. And so we move into that conflict. We ask for forgiveness. We strengthen our love, but we put on love. The thing that we should be wearing consistently daily is love. 1 Corinthians 12 said, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To be part of a community, the Spirit empowers you with specific gifts that are used to encourage the community of God. I mean, there are people, a lot of people can teach and do it amazingly, but then there are those who are empowered by the Spirit to do that. There are a lot of people who are encouraging, but then there are people who are empowered by the Spirit to do that. There are a lot of people who can help others, but then there are those who are empowered by the Spirit to do that. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, the Spirit is giving you gifts to use to encourage others in this place. Not to just hold on to, not just for yourself, but for the common good, that this place would be strengthened. And so how has God made you to encourage others? I mean, we sang the song, Lead Me to the Cross, earlier, of which the team did amazing, right? Uh, we, can we encourage our worship team just right now? Can we thank them for... I mean... Throughout all of this, we've only been meeting on site for a month, but since March that all this has been going on, our worship team and our tech team have just been carrying the biggest of burdens, and so I just really appreciate all that they're doing, and Alexandra's giving Kayla a hug back there for it, but we did, that just represents all of us right now, so that's good. Um, but why, how have you been gifted? And we think about that lead me to the cross, sometimes that's hard to get there. We all need to get to the cross. We all need to be in the presence of Jesus. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes life is difficult. And if this season has shown us anything, it's how much we need him. But sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the reality of who we are. We need to be reminded that this isn't our, only our story. That we need to be reminded of what Jesus has done. We need to be reminded to take our burdens to him. And reminding ourselves is difficult, sometimes impossible. But when we're connected with others, that's the whole idea of community, is people come alongside us and say, if you can't get to the cross, then let me carry you there. If you can't get to Jesus, then let me carry you there. If you can't figure this out, let me carry you. If you feel like you can't keep going, let me walk with you. 
we need one another. The unity that God calls us to pursue gives us the encouragement and the support that we need, not just in living for Christ, but for journeying through life in and of itself. And so church, how can you be an encouragement to others? Don't let the distance that the current scenario imposes make you distant. Do you mean, did you hear what I just said? Do not let the distance that the current scenario imposes make you distant. We, this is challenging. This is difficult for all of us. And so don't use the difficulty as an excuse to go into isolation. That's something we've been saying all along, but now's the time we need to be reminded of it because now's the time that we need to start getting connected before things get challenging again as we move into this winter. Pursuing unity strengthens and encourages the family of God. The other thing that the psalmist tells us as far as why we want to pursue unity is that pursuing unity impacts the surrounding community for God. It's like the dew, unity is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, another word picture is given here. Not um, speaking specifically of Mount Hermon in Israel. Do I have a picture of that? Mount Hermon, yes. So it's a mountain, and it's in the northern part of Israel. Huge mountain in the northern part of Israel. And apparently, the dew that would come off of this mountain was really heavy, just really thick, and would cover the land. Now, why would that matter? Because it can be really hot and dry in the summers in Israel. Incredibly hot. And during a season when there's little to no rain, dew was critical to water the harvest. Without dew, the land couldn't get any water. And so the mountains of Zion that's mentioned here, where Jerusalem is, is quite a ways away from Mount Hermon. It might be difficult if you're in the sanctuary, but that top yellow dot is where Mount Hermon is, and this bottom one is where Jerusalem is. It's basically almost the entire country. And so it says, the, like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Well, it's a really far away for that mountain dew to fall. That's a pretty far target for it to hit. But that's the imagery here. As the dew traveled from the mountain to Zion, the land was watered. That's the emphasis. The needed, important dew was going to cover the land. It's going to impact everyone and everything between these two mountains. This is the image that the psalmist gives us here about our unity. Our unity, when the church family can, pursues unity, not just like, you know, I like you, but pursues life together, pursues working through this together, pursues leading one another to the cross, pursues caring for one another, the way the Bible talks about throughout the scriptures, when we pursue that, not only does it encourage everyone in these walls and in this place, it can be an impact and an encouragement to everybody outside these walls. The blessing of life is from God. He's the source of our unity. When we live in the unity that God provides, not only does it strengthen us, but it's going to strengthen this neighborhood. When we live in a unity with one another, the reality of the life which God has given us is poured out in abundance on the culture we are in. We not only should be encouraging one another, how can this place unified encourage those we're connected with, that we have influence on, that we interact with on a regular basis? This idea resonates with the words of Jesus. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. People are going to know me, Jesus says, based on how they see and interact with you. 
based on how we show life with Jesus, people are going to understand Jesus, which is really disheartening when we see some of the claims that are made in the name of Jesus in our world today. As the political season just keeps ramping up and we see accusations of what this person is and what they're like and what really Christianity is and what it's not. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of God and it is not a political party. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of God and it's about Jesus and his love being spread everywhere. That's what we need to be about. Showing it in this place but also to others regardless of who they are, what they've done, who they're doing, who they voted for, or anything else. And if we can only show love to those who vote according to us, then we're not living like people of the kingdom of God. We're living like people of the kingdom of this place, of this country. And that's not our identity. We need to show love to all people. There is a missional emphasis to our unity. And during this time of challenges, people need to see the love of God flowing from his people. During this season, whether it's political unrest, racial tension, or the pandemic itself, the world needs to see the love of God flowing through the love of his people. We can't talk to the rest of the church But I can say this to us, we need to be committed to be conduits of God's love for all people. People will come to know and experience God based on what they know and experience about our church. Think about the reality of even what we're going through. To be able to, it might be hard to invite somebody here. They might not feel comfortable coming uh, on a Sunday. Well, letting them know, hey, you should come Sign online. We're doing groups in our church. We're, we have benevolence help. Let people know how they can be connected and experience the love of God and invite them through what you're going through, that they can see the love of God in action. We can pursue our unity with each other so that the dew of God's grace can pour out from us to the world around us. Pursuing unity impacts the surrounding community for God. We're meant to crank this song up. We're meant to be singing this, not just with our vocal cords, but with our lives. We are one with Christ because of his crucifixion, his resurrection, because of what he did for us. We have life in him, true life. And we are connected with him and we're connected with one another. That should be something we're pursuing to encourage us, to strengthen us, to empower us, to change the neighborhoods in the city that we're within, we should be pursuing this. So this goes back to what we talked about last week, the idea of needing to circle up. I gave this imagery of the idea of a basketball team circling up before the game, during the game, after the game, of reminding ourselves what we're here for, encouraging one another, maybe challenging one another, but keeping our eyes on the goal. Keep, keep going. Don't give up. Let's do this. And so the question is, who are we circling up with as a church? Who are you circling up with in this place? We all are gathering together on Sundays. We are here. You're being encouraged. We're worshiping together, knowing that we're part of something, but we also need to circle up midweek. Pursue unity together to encourage one another and see ways we can encourage those around us. And so the challenge that I've been giving, I gave last week, and I give that challenge again this week, is to take the next two, in the next, two, over the next course of the next two months, getting ready for the winter that's ahead, that you would have a group of people at church that you could habitually connect with. A group of people at church that you can circle up with. A group of four to six different people to connect with once a week. Simply for the idea of talking about the ups and the downs of the week and how your walk with Jesus is. And yet, part of that's remind, knowing that you're not in isolation. Part of that's being encouraged. Part of that's helping with loneliness. But the point of this, the goal of this, the importance of this is that we need to be encouraged in our walks with Jesus. 
We need to be encouraged with who we are in him. We need to be encouraged with faithfulness and our unity with one another. And so who can you circle up with? And then I know that for a lot of us, it's, well, yeah, I know people at church, and I mean, I can reach out to people. I'm not talking about just having those on-call people. I'm talking about an intentional once a week, four or six people, just to gather with, whether it's socially outside distance or on Zoom, phone call, text, whatever that might be, four or six people that you're going to connect with them weekly to check how the ups, what's been up, what's been down, and how is your walk with Jesus. And so if this is something that you want to participate in, many of those awesome to see how many people responded to this last week. But if you weren't able to respond to this last week, if this is something that you're interested in, this needs you to text the word circle to that number. And so we're already started working through the logistics of this and been kind of putting people and uh, seeing the different people's interests and things like that. The goal is to let people know this week about different, um, some of the different groups that are available. We already have some that are um, some guy groups that are going to be formed, some specific lady groups are going to be formed, some that are specific to college age, um, married couples, singles without kids, like hitting the whole gamut. Um, but we need to know who's interested and really need to know if people would be interested in facilitating some of these. Um, that we, we need more people who would be willing to say, hey, I would love to be the one that would gather a group of people. And so if you haven't already responded, if you just text the word circle to that number, we're going to get these started the week of the 13th. Is that good? Does that make sense? Um, this season, we're, I think about CPS. I think about all these students around Chicago whose entire school year is starting not the way that they want it to start. The teachers that are having to deal with this, the parents that are going to have to deal with this, our college students who are dealing with this how it impacts, how the season has impacted those who are working and working from home and or struggling with jobs, looking for work. This has been a challenging season. It's going to get more challenging as it goes on. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. You need people to help carry this load for you. You need people to help lighten the load for you. You need people to encourage you along the way, to be shouting out these songs of worship and unity with Christ along the way. Not only do you need to hear people singing these encouragements to you, speaking these encouragements and reminders to you, but you need to be using your gifts to encourage others along the way as well. We need to be ready. We need to have all hands on deck. We need to circle up now. Because people need to know Jesus, and we need to be faithful to him. And so if, or if anything, let's circle up for that. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We praise you for your love for us. We thank you so much for what you are doing in this community. God, I pray that you would, I pray that you would continue to fashion us. I pray that you would continue to mold us. God, I pray specifically for the opportunities that we're going to have in the weeks and months ahead to connect with people who don't go to this church, who are part of our classes, who are part of work, who are neighbors, for those conversations to be able to encourage them, to walk alongside them, to show them the love of Christ. God, I pray for the conversations we're going to be able to have with one another, to be able to walk with one another, to carry these loads with one another, to remind one another of your love. God, help us to continue to build on you, to be strengthened in you, to be rooted and foundation in you. Forgive us for the times when we stray away. Forgive us for the times we make excuses, for the times when we get apathetic, God. God, I pray you would kill apathy in the body of Christ. God, I pray that you would cause us to repent for apathy. I pray you would light a fire, a burden, God, of care for one another, of care for your church, of care for people knowing about you. God, help us to not be lazy, apathetic Christians, but that you would do something in this church, that you would unite us with you and one another, and that your love would pour forth from this place. 
we know it can only happen in you. And so, God, we just beg you to do your work. Thank you for allowing us to join you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and we'll do